Good morning, guys. We are starting momentarily. If everybody could please be seated. As a reminder, there is no food or drink in the council chambers. If you are speaking today to testify, please sign up a slip and bring it to the sergeant of arms desk. Thank you.
afternoon and thank you all for the committee hearing. My name is Jesus and I'm the chair of this committee. I'm today by my colleague, Council Member Mike. Today, we will discuss several pieces of legislation on a range of topics. Intro 1375 and 1397, introduced by Council Member Matthew, will require DOT to alert local communities boards, council members, and borough presidents 10 days prior to the issuing of a permit to open a recently repaved street, also known as protected street. It will require that following a street opening, the street be restored all the way to the curb line and 20 feet along the curb from the spot of the opening. We will hear from Council Member Matthew in a few moments. We will also hear two bills that I recently introduced. The first bill, intro 1646, will require all black car and luxury limousine base, bases to allow passengers to tip drivers in whatever methods of payment they use to pay for the trip. This is important because the bill will require all apps based black car services to include a tipping option for drivers, something that have, that have been reluctant to do. Driving a cab is a top job in our city and for many who, close, who choose to work in this industry, this is their career, which they use to send their kids to college or they themselves work at day or evening and also go to college. Personally, I know the number of hours required in this industry to make a living because when I was at City College during the daytime, I also drove a, car, a liberal taxi during the nighttime to support myself, myself and help my family. One of, the ways, one of the ways drivers have always boosted their earnings is through tips. It encouraged quality service in a, safe, a, in, sorry, in a safe and easy ride and can make a major difference in the life of a driver. Tipping is an available option through the user interface in yellow and green taxis and through some apps-based companies like Lyft and Lyft. However, this option has not been uniform throughout the industry. Earlier this year, the Independence Drivers Guild a trade organization representing predominantly over drivers filed a petition with 11,000 signatures. This petition highlight that over drivers were potentially missing out on a total of 300 million based on looking at passengers' behavior in yellow cups. Just this week, Thanks to more and more calls to add a tipping option, as well as spending agency rules, and this specific bill we will hear today. Uber has finally relented to their long-standing opposition to providing a tipping option and will begin to roll these features out across the country. And we don't expect that that change will change the 30% earning that drivers make at Uber. This is, of course, welcome news, but I believe we as a city must ensure that not just Uber, but all app-based companies provide a tipping option through their online platform. And this is why Intro 1646 will accomplish this goal. It reaffirms the dignity of those who drive on our street, and instead of an arbitrary and even Punitive rating system, tipping rewards, good service, and put money in the package of drivers. We are glad that we will hear from the IDG and some of their members today and will discuss the realities and financial hardship that many drivers are faced with. I would like to ensure that this measure is codified in law as opposed for being done only through internal company policy or agency rulemaking, because we want to put this in the books for a long time, not to undone 
by changes at certain companies or by future occupants at TLC. I look forward to discussing this with the many here today and hope we can arrive at a solution to best support our hardworking driver and give ease to those who want to support them as well. Lastly, today we will hear Intro 1658, a bill I introduced and co-lead with another 29 council members, aiming, aimed at addressing a glaring vulnerability on our street and sidewalks. This bill will require the DOT to install metal or concrete bollards at locations across the city where we remain vulnerable to a type of attack becoming tragically more common by the week. These bollards will be required in front of city schools, plaza, plazas, uh, pedestrian plazas adjacent, adjacent to car traffic and at the most dangerous corridors in the city, measured by DOT crash totals and designated priority corridors. Just over a month ago, a young 18 years old tourist had her life lost away from her as she enjoyed the glow of Times Square on a spring afternoon with her younger sister. A driver deliberately took his car onto the sidewalk with the intention of killing or injuring as many people as possible. Alisa Alsman is no longer with us today because these murderous drivers was able to mount the curb and gun his engine toward helpless pedestrian in the crossroads of the world. world. But the same day that I introduced the bill, two other car vehicles also jumped into the sidewalk, one around 39th Street and the other one at the corner of Columbia Presbyterian. Since then, we've seen those separate and tragic and other tragic terrorist attack occur in London in just this month, involving drivers who use a vehicle as a weapon of mass destruction and who drove into sidewalks to take the lives of others. We had to learn from what happened in London and in other cities, and we had to celebrate that in New York City after 9-11, we had to have another terrorist attack. And here in New York, on the same day I announced again this legislation, many New Yorkers started sending their messages through Twitter and email supporting this comprehensive policy. These examples show that whatever through terrorism, a sickness individual or even simply a driver who hit the gas at the wrong moment, pedestrians can have their life taken from them even when, when, in, when on a sidewalk doing what they are supposed to do. Our sidewalks are not safe havens from cars, and those with the most people on them remain burnable, burnable, just like, the, like areas in front of schools and parks and in locations known to see many crashes. The one thing that stopped the Times Square driver, however, was a metal bowler. This is why even before the Times Square attack, I began to work on this bill to think about sensitive locations where a driver could do severe damage. I thought not about important business in their corporate headquarters, location where we often see many bowlers, but instead I consider our schools and the areas where pedestrians have a con had naturally congregated. These are places we must protect and this past month could not make that any clearer. My colleagues agree and that's why so many have signed to be called on to support this effort even before the bill was introduced. We hope to hear today from agencies and stakeholders how we can move these important measures forward and support and protect New Yorkers. In a moment, we will hear from the Department of Transportation and the Taxi and Limousine Commission. But first, I would like to offer my colleague, Council Member uh, Matthew, uh, an opportunity to uh, speak on his legislation. 
Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Um, I have an article from the Advance, Staten Island Advance, dated uh, August 11, 2006. It refers to a DOT initiative called Take Back the Streets that was essentially a crackdown on illegal street cuts and shoddy repair work. Um, this was an issue that former Mid Allen Councilman and current Borough President Jimmy Otto has been working on for quite some time. Uh, during this time, I was his chief of staff, and we are teaming up once again to do all we can to ensure our newly resurfaced streets remain in pristine condition. But with every bad street cut, it undermines our collective effort to improve our roads. That is the reason we introduced these two bills, intros 1375 and 1397. For years, the city did not make adequate investment in resurfacing our streets. But all that changed in the last several budget cycles. The city has made record improvements with over 1,200 lane miles resurfaced in the current fiscal year alone. The mayor, DOT, and the coalition of elected officials that supported this funding deserve a lot of credit for getting this done. However, the frequent cuts, particularly emergency cuts, which utility companies and other entities undertake threatens that progress. When a utility company when a utility company comes to do work on a street that was recently resurfaced, the result is confusion among residents about what is going to occur and anger at the waste of taxpayer funds that were recently used to make this street new. Frequently, it is unclear even to elected officials' offices as to why the work is occurring and how long it will take. On top of that, the patch job is often inadequate. I have driven on roads that resurfaced in the last several years that are already uneven and cracked because of poor patchwork after a utility cut project concluded. These bills are meant to clear up any ambiguity so that the public officials closest to these issues are able to answer constituents' questions and communicate directly with those doing the work if need be. These bills will make sure that the taxpayers are whole and the patch job is done satisfactorily and that proper notice is given when cuts are made to the protected streets. Um, with that, I'm looking forward to having a, a discussion with you on the two bills and uh, seeing how we can come up with an adequate solution to this problem. Thank you, Chair. I also to, I wanted to I wanted to recognize that also we were joined here by Council Member Minority, Majority Leader Jimmy Brown Bramer. And before we begin, I would like to thank our committee staff, Council Faisal Malik, Policy Analyst Jonathan Maserano, Emily Rooney, and Finance Analyst Branton West and Shima Obicher. I also want to thank my staff. Uh, uh, Jose Luis, Russell Murphy, and Stephanie Emiliano for the effort in putting this hearing together. Now I ask our council to please administer the information and welcome testimony from the representative of the administration. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Good morning. Um, good morning, Chair Rodriguez um, and uh, members of council joining us today. I'm Mira Zoshi, Commissioner and Chair of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission, and thank you for the opportunity for us to share TLC's views on intro 1646. This legislation would require black car and luxury limousine bases that dispatch vehicles through an app to provide a tipping option for passengers through one of the methods, payment that pass methods of payment that passengers use to pay for the underlying fare. Such services would be required to inform passengers of the gratuity option and make drivers aware that they've received a tip as soon as practicable. Finally, intro 1646 would subject people who violate the law to a fine of 200 to 500 and require TLC to promulgate rules as may be necessary. Chair Rodriguez and the TLC have worked hard to protect our licensed drivers and their income, and TLC supports the stated goal of this legislation, which is to expand drivers' ability to access their hard-earned tips. As you know, just this week, Uber announced that it will implement an in-app tipping option nationwide, and we should all be gratified to see, yes, um, the industry embrace the city's policy initiative. I am concerned, however, that the proposed legislation excludes certain types of drivers and does not require that the tip be directly or fully transmitted to the deserving driver. 
Like the council, we believe the drivers should be able to easily access the money they earn, and the TLC announced on April 7, 2017, that we would propose a rule requiring four hire vehicle bases to offer passengers the option of tipping drivers through the exact same means that they paid for the underlying fare. This means that if a passenger can pay the fare through an app, the base, every base, is required to allow the passenger to tip through the app. TLC's proposed rule would apply industry-wide and includes a clear requirement that all tips, including those received via app, must be trip, d transmitted directly to drivers. Our proposed rule has been noticed for a public hearing on July 13, 2017. And while the proposed TLC rule is similar in spirit to Intro 1646, we believe that our proposed rule is an effective way to more expansively and more effectively benefit hardworking drivers. Our primary concern with Intro 1646 as drafted is that it would regulate bases in a non-uniform manner. It contains exclusions that would prevent certain groups of drivers from receiving the income, the tip income they've earned. And we believe that all drivers are equally deserving of income protection. Currently, Intro 1646 includes black car and luxury limousine bases, but it does not notably include livery bases. The reason for this exclusion is unclear to us, because several livery bases, including one livery base operated by Uber, use apps for passenger booking and for payment. Under Intro 1646, all of those drivers who use who use that base for jobs would not be able to receive tips via the app. Similarly, the bill excludes drivers who perform in-line work by prearrangement, definition of which would be, could be read to include airport pickups, another group of drivers that would be excluded from tips. And finally, TLC believes that Section 1947B of the proposed legislation would allow a black car base that occasionally accepts cash payments to continue requiring tipping in cash even if some or most of its trips are dispatched and paid via an app. This language could potentially exclude another additional category of drivers. Today, because more and more people are booking rides and paying fares through apps and fewer people carry cash, a cash-only option for tips deprives app-based dispatch drivers of potential income. As such, TLC's second major concern is that Intro 1646 requires that drivers shall be made aware of any gratuity received by any passenger-facing booking tool as soon as possible. But, Importantly, it does not require that drivers who are tipped through the app actually receive those tips directly or receive them in a timely manner. Furthermore, as written, the legislation does not prevent the base from taking any deductions from the tip before giving it to the driver, nor does it require the full tip be transmitted directly to the driver. We strongly believe that all app dispatch drivers should be able to receive a tip via app and they should receive the tip the entire tip that they've earned quickly, fully, and directly. As such, our proposed rule would require that the base give the entirety of the tip to the drivers directly, free of any deductions made by the base. C supports requiring all bases who use apps to let their passengers tip via app. However, for the reasons I've just provided, we're confident that LC's already noticed role will accomplish this goal more effectively than Intro 1646. Our rule will protect all drivers in a uniform and effective manner, creating more income opportunities for more drivers. We thank you for the opportunity to testify on Intro 1646, and I'm free to answer any questions you may have. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the committee. My name is Leon Hayward, Deputy Commissioner for Sidewalks and Inspection Management at the New York City Department of Transportation, and I am joined by Montgomery Dean, Chief of Staff to the Chief Operation Officer. Also present is Joe Yocker, Director of our HICWA Operation. I'm here today to testify on behalf of Commissioner Trottenberg and Mayor de Blasio on DOT's important work to maintain and protect New York City's nearly 20,000 lane miles of street. I'm also joined today by Michelle Craven, 
who will be speaking about introduction 1658, requiring the installation of ballots at certain locations. When Commissioner Trottenberg first started her job, when Commissioner Trottenberg first started her job, she heard more complaints about the poor condition of the streets than almost anything else. Since then, we increased our investment to execute back-to-back -back years of record resurfacing. Under Mayor de Blasio, leadership in FY16 to FY19, we will pave over 5,000 lane miles of our streets, most in need, more than a quarter of all the city's nearly 20,000 20, lane miles. Compared to an average resurfacing budget in the three preceding years of $180 million, DLT spent $195 million in FY15, $238 million in FY16, and in planning to spend $274 million in FY17, with similar levels planned for FY18 and FY19. We have also nearly doubled our investment in street reconstruction to build out more safety projects taking the amount from $1.7 billion in the last 10-year capital plan in the prior administration to $3.3 billion in this year's 10-year plan, plan. So we share the, council, the Council's interest in protecting our record investment and look forward to continuing to work with you to ensure our streets are maintained in safe and good condition. Our streets facilitate the movement of pedestrians, transit riders, motorists, and cyclists, as well as the delivery of goods and services throughout the city. Under the surface, the same streets support the city's water, sewer, power, and telecommunications infrastructure, as well as its subway tunnels and building vaults. The streets themselves also serve as public spaces, fostering social, economic, and recreational activities. Excavations of our streets are a necessity to install and maintain the underground infrastructure our city requires to function. And with an ongoing boom in construction, DOT is issuing 70% more street opening permits than a decade ago. A substantial and important regulatory task for DOT is managing a process that minimizes the number of excavations that occur while facilitating necessary access to underground infrastructure. And it is vital that we ensure quality street restorations while also minimizing disruption for both street users and residents. In order to accomplish all this, several of DOT's divisions are involved in this work. Our first office, our Office of Construction Mitigation and Coordination, issued 587,000 construction permits related to our streets in the most recent fiscal year, including 228,000 street excavation permits. Of those, 62,775, or 27%, were on streets were surfaced in the past five years. In addition, the office reviews requests for full street closures, work on arterial streets, large-scale projects, and projects in the densest and most congested parts of the city, attaching additional stipulations to permits for these type of work. I oversee high, Highway Inspection and Quality Quality Assurance Unit, or HICWA, which includes teams of specially trained inspectors that continuously visit and monitor construction activity in the field, both proactively and in response to complaints, to ensure that any work being conducted has the proper permits and the permit holder is complying with the appropriate DLT rules, specifications, and stipulations. Finally, our Division of Roadway Repair and Maintenance plays a crucial role by coordinating all of our maintenance and resurfacing work. This includes informing utilities and others of DOT's resurfacing schedule for purpose of coordination and taking part in the review of permit requests on protected streets. As you might imagine, the types of permits that DOT administers are sometimes highly technical, and we are very proud of our Street Works Manual, a resource for utilities, developers, contractors, and anyone who undertakes work that will impact the street that explains the importance of advance notice and coordination, outlines our registration process, and describes application procedures for each type of permit and all necessary approvals. This guide can be found at streetworksmanual.nyc. Before commenting on the legislation before the committee today, I would like to describe DOT's current process for ensuring durable, quality, restorations of all our city streets and describe the additional requirements we have for protected streets. All permittees must follow rules and regulations 
and conform to specifications and standard detailed drawings. We require that all jobs are properly backfilled and restored, neatly squared off and sealed around the edges to provide a level, smooth, and durable riding surface. Our inspectors can stop and review work at any time during a project. When our inspectors encounter, encounter defects after, restora after a restoration has been completed, the severity can dictate various actions. For minor repairs, we issue a 30-day corrective action request. However, if a restoration is very poor and that it is sunken or not to specification, several aggressive reviews and remedies will take place. If it, if it presents an immediate safety issue, a notice of immediate corrective action requiring the area to be made safe within three hours will be issued and our HICO unit will then follow up until the dangerous condition is resolved. Then DOT will schedule a re-excavation in the presence of an inspector who will control every aspect of the restoration. This will include specifying the permit type and when the work can be done, requiring all new fill, requiring the presence of a soil testing laboratory, and in most cases, requiring that concrete is used as a base material and paving a greater area than was originally opened. If a contractor does not comply, they could be subject to a hold on all new permit requests. We also require permittees to post a bond to be used to pay for restorations should a company go out of business. As you can see, contractors certainly have every reason to want to avoid a required redig. So this provides a strong incentive to do the job right and avoid defects in the first place, which is our primary goal. On protective streaks, we have enhanced requirements. Streets that have been resurfaced within the past 18 months are automatically reviewed for additional provisions, including curb-to-curb -curb resurfacing or potentially resurfacing the entire block or intersection as warranted. In the most recent fiscal year, this additional pre-review applied to 17,366 permit requests or 7% of street excavation permits. For the entire five years after resurfacing, contractors are required to pay an additional fee and arrange to have DOT inspectors on site to supervise the backfill in person. And permittees are required to guarantee the restoration for five years. I would also like to highlight some amendments to our highway rules that DOT recently enacted to enhance the quality of restorations on all our streets. These new rules went into effect in August and DOT completed phasing and enforcement this past April. First and foremost, DOT is now requiring in-kind restoration of all concrete sub-base material. Previously, permittees were allowed to use asphalt instead of concrete. DOT has been pursuing this requirement for several years and we think it will be impactful. Second, permittees must now make all cuts with straight edges and 90 degree angles. Previously, cuts made at unusual angles led to more uneven surfaces and reduced durability. This change will mean cleaner cuts that are more durable and more complete restoration in the affected area, resulting in less of a patchwork. Now, with regard to the bills, starting with introduction 1375, this bill requires 10 days notice by DOT to affected council members, community boards, and borough presidents before issuing a street opening on any street that has been resurfaced or reconstructed in the past five years, or notice within 25 hours in case of emergency permits. It would appear that the concern driving the bill is that too many permits are issued on these streets for work that is avoidable or should have been planned better. DOT plans its paving schedule based on both capital construction plans and available information on planned work by the utilities. We distribute our schedule to stakeholders and make it available online. In addition, each borough's administrative superintendent of highway operations for our Division of Roadway Repair and Maintenance conducts a monthly coordination meeting with other city agencies as well as utility companies, transit operators, and other stakeholders involved in our, in our affected by, and are affected by resurfacing projects. These coordination meetings are held so that other roadway stakeholders are aware of resurfacing and other repair projects that are occurring, as well as to facilitate better right-of-way planning. The schedule is often modified to allow those with underground infrastructure to inspect and perform necessary work in advance of paving operation. 
Despite these dedicated effort, efforts, it is impossible to predict every needed street opening and align it with plan resurfacing. In addition to emergency work, DOT invariably receives permit requests for a certain number of construction or infrastructure projects that could not have been anticipated or completed five years or even 18 months in advance. While we do sometimes deny permits, if there is clear evidence that the work could and should have been performed earlier, the most important thing we can do is to try to minimize the number of such street openings in the first place through coordination. The proposed notification requirement would place significant administrative burden on DOT, requiring it to send email notifications and track the completion of statutory notification periods before issuing permits. Additionally, DOT has made significant efforts to make our permitting process faster and more user-friendly, and this bill would add delays to the thousand of permit requests, many of which DOT otherwise strives to fulfill on a same-day basis. While DOT cannot support the bill as proposed, we are open to working with the sponsor. We will be happy to explore ways to better inform stakeholders about permits being issued for work in their communities and will continue to coordinate with those who need to work under our streets to reduce the number of necessary openings that occur in the greatest extent possible. Now, turning to introduction 1397, which would require curb-to-curb -curb resurfacing and an additional 20 feet of resurfacing up and down the street in either direction for restorations of all excavations on streets resurfaced or reconstructed within the past five years. As I discussed before above, DOT reviews a portion of applications for permits on protected streets and adds expanded resurfacing stipulations where appropriate, including repaving entire blocks or intersections. However, this legislation would enact a blanket requirement without consideration of the size or location of the excavation or the particular condition of the site. This would negate the balanced approach we take to the application of these requirements and in some cases require unwanted amounts of paving activity. While DOT understands and shares the desire to enforce strict restora restoration requirements, excess paving requirements must be weighed against the added costs they impose on construction projects and above all, the larger street closures entailed, which leads to more disruption and traffic delays. When considering street restoration, it is also important to differentiate differentiate between street openings in the travel lanes of a street which receive significant vehicle wear and parking lanes or channelizations or shoulder areas of the street which receive minimum or significantly less wear. Larger paving requirements are not a panacea. Paving a larger area will not prevent defects caused by inferior backfill or improper compaction. This is why DOT is, is successfully pursuing more robust requirements for these aspects of restoration. Larger paving requirements can also potentially affect the grade and elevation of the roadbed, leading to ponding issues. These requirements could turn a, two, a small two-foot plumber's cut into a project requiring over 100 lane feet of paving or more, especially on a wide street. In particular, this could affect smaller businesses doing work for individual homeowners. For small businesses, the added requirement to run a large paving project for a small plumbing job could effectively exclude them from taking certain jobs, contrary to New York City's Small Business First initiative. For homeowners, these requirements could make what is already an expensive project much more costly in the case of an emergency or unforeseen house connection project. Our colleagues from DOT performed an analysis of water and sewer permits issued annually and found that on average in a given year, about 3,000 property owners citywide, including almost 500 on Staten Island, would be subject to additional costs as a result of the pro proposed legislation and estimate that in the case of a new water sewer, sewer line, the cost to the homeowner could increase from 5,000 to 15,000. While utilities and larger developers may be more able to handle the added requirements proposed in this legislation, Never, nevertheless, they would see increases to the cost of doing work on protected streets for projects that are priorities for the city. For example, those related to the construction of affordable housing, creation of green infrastructure, or installation of new traffic signals, to name a few. 
This would be true for construction projects carried out by our sister agencies as well, particular DEP and DDC. DEP conducted an analysis and found that the proposed legislation would increase its costs for sewer and catch basin repair alone by over $13 million. If these requirements led to better, more durable restorations, that would be a cost to be weighed. However, for the reasons I've laid out, DOT believes the associated costs would be significant while their improvements to the quality of restorations would be cosmetic. While DOT cannot support this bill as drafted, we would like to engage with the sponsor to evaluate a way forward to address the underlying concerns. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak before you today on these bills and the important work of protecting and maintaining our street. It is critical to allow for necessary access to the underground infrastructure our city depends on, while minimizing disruption and protecting the investment in our road network. I'm happy to answer any question you may have. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez. I am Michelle Craven, Senior Executive of Cityscape and Franchises. Also to answer questions regarding this legislation are Sean Quinn, Senior Director of the Office of Bicycle and Pedestrian Programs, and Ed Schnell, Director of Revocable Consents and Security. Thank you for having us here today on behalf of Commissioner Trottenberg and Mayor de Blasio to discuss Intro 1658, requiring the installation of bollards consistent with pedestrian safety and in accordance with DOT guidelines at schools, plazas, and Vision Zero priority intersections. DOT recognizes the heightened concern on the part of the Council for protecting pedestrian spaces in response to the recent incident in Times Square, as well as acts of terrorism in other cities using vehicles to drive into crowded pedestrian areas. Today I will describe the ways in which DOT partners with the NYPD when it comes to the installation of bollards for security purposes. Otherwise, non-security bollards are a tool in DOT's repertoire, and I will discuss ways in which we use them for a few particular purposes. From the outset, I would caution against any bill which would institute a requirement for DOT to consider every location of a particular type for the installation of any kind of bollard. There is no one-size-fits-all fix for street safety, and we have many means available to address our varied city streetscapes. When it comes to security bollards, the proposed legislation would interfere with the expertise and informed judgment of the NYPD regarding counterterrorism measures. And when it comes to any other use of bollards, this would be an inefficient use of DOT's resources and attention. It would conflict with our approach of selecting the right designs, treatments, and features based on the context of each location in the course of our work, whether we are focusing on intersections in need of redesign, constructing new plaza spaces, or enhancing school safety. Crashes that take place on sidewalks are shocking, but are responsible for a small percentage of all pedestrian fatalities and serious injuries. And importantly, they are less predictable. Unlike pedestrian injuries overall, overall excuse me, targeting high volume, high injury locations will not necessarily have much of an impact on these types of crashes in the way that it does for crashes involving serious injuries and fatalities overall. Moreover, installing bollards designed to stop the impact of a vehicle is often complicated and expensive and can, can potentially cost millions of dollars. Therefore, the sites must be chosen with the utmost care and input from security experts. Installation includes assessing and either moving or accommodating underground infrastructure, water, sewer, power and telecommunications, subway tunnels and building vaults, as well as sidewalk excavation to install anchors which may be connected together. Muni meters or street furniture may need to be relocated, and preserving street trees requires specialized bollards with horizontal connectors. ADA accessibility must be considered. Bollards can cause conflicts with our pedestrian ramps, although if they are installed as part of a larger capital project, they can also make some enhancements to ramp design possible. Emergency vehicle access for incident response also must be considered, and the FDNY is therefore involved in our assessments as well. Bollards have significant impacts on curbside loading and unloading, including passengers and wheelchairs. When it comes to curbside loading, the impacts at school locations would particularly need to be considered. Bollard installation also removes about two and a half feet on average from the pedestrian clear path on a sidewalk. In congested locations, this loss of space for pedestrians could cause people to spill into the street. As you know, DOT is seeking to open up and expand pedestrian space in our city, a mandate strengthened by Local Law 95, recently signed into law by Mayor de Blasio and championed by Chairman Rodriguez. Placing pedestrians all across the city behind barricades would conflict with that goal. 
The considerable resources and time devoted to these numerous capital projects would detract from our ability to execute more street improvement projects and build out more sidewalk space in congested areas of the city. Instead, to protect pedestrians on the street, including in the crosswalk and on the sidewalk, we are focusing our resources and energy under Vision Zero on street design, enforcement efforts, and public outreach, which together are changing driver behavior overall, reducing speeding and reckless driving. We must also continue to target unlicensed driving and driving while impaired. Therefore, while each different type of bollard can be useful in certain situations, Duty cannot support the legislation as proposed. We use bollards for a few specific purposes. When it comes to the installation of bollards for security, we rely on our NYPD colleagues to identify locations where this may be needed and for analysis of what rating of bollard or level of protection should be achieved. DOT reviews these locations and provides our expertise in pedestrian and ADA access and construction constraints. For example, in Times Square during the capital construction of the plazas, we included bollards at the request of NYPD for security purposes. As you know, Times Square is a unique location and the only one where DOT through DDC has installed bollards ourselves. More commonly, DOT and NYPD work together when individual property owners install bollards as a building security measure, which make up most of the bollards you see around New York, including at landmark buildings. At our intersections, sidewalk edges, and plazas, we use a variety of treatments to separate vehicles and pedestrians depending on the needs and space available at the location. Some provide a physical barrier while others delineate or channelize vehicular traffic, and many do some combination of both. First and foremost, this includes the curb itself. Aside from clearly delineating the roadway from pedestrian space, the height of the curb serves as a partial physical barrier as well. Among other measures, we also use street trees, landscaping features, flexible delineators, planters, and granite blocks. These last three are particularly appropriate for non-capital plazas because they are interim and removable while providing protection and visibility for each of the spaces. Each of our treatments also takes up more or less space that would otherwise be available for pedestrian movement, so we must balance that as well. We generally use non-security bollards in some specific incidences, instances where we are trying to control vehicle access, such as in a plaza. Plaza de las Americas has removable bollards at driveway ramps to allow vehicle access only during events set up. Fordham Plaza has bollards lining a driveway area that is within the plaza to keep cars and trucks within their permitted zone. Similarly, we use basic pipe-style bollards in some places on our sidewalks where we seek to prevent cars from parking, ensuring a clear pedestrian pathway. But when it comes to the edges of plazas, generally, we treat them like sidewalks and do not line the spaces with bollards. Additionally, permanent bollards would be incompatible with our current use of interim materials in some plazas. We will continue to use our current toolkit to protect these spaces. And finally, we use Bell and Martello bollards on our pedestrian islands, which are lowered to the ground and are designed to protect the island from turning vehicles. DOT will continue to coordinate with NYPD on bollard protection for pedestrian locations at sites they determine to have a high security threat, and will continue to partner with NYPD to conduct assessments on construction feasibility and costs. Once again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to comment on intro 1658 and discuss our use of bollards. My colleagues and I would now be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, and before I ask some questions, I'd like to recognize that also I was joined by Council Member Reynoso, eh, Garani, Constantinides, Chin, Richards, Miller, and Menchaca. Eh, I have a few questions. The question. Can we agree that the use of vehicles as a weapons of mass destruction can be used by terrorists in New York City? I think given the instances we've seen around the world, it's certainly a threat, yes. Yeah. Is the DOT working right now to identify how many intersections we have in New York City that they are open for cars to get into the sidewalk and plaza do we have as today? Well, we are constantly talking to NYPD about areas that are potential targets or potential threats for terrorist activity. What is the number of, pla of, of those particular intersection as today? Can you share with all that DOT has identified that they are open for cars to get into sidewalk? I don't have that information. That's, that's what this law is trying to do. That's what this bill is trying to do, to put together a comprehensive policy so that the, every year DOT and we as a city should be able to share with the council and the city 
in how many plaza, street plaza, how many schools per year are we working and we put in the money? Because the funding that, you know, I'm happy to say that the, the amount of money that you share for, for, for FY18, you know, that money was allocated after negotiation between the administration and the council and voted by the council. So I'm very happy to say that working together with Mayor de Blasio and the DOT Commission, and we've been, you know, taking, making a, a, our top priority to save the life of pedestrians or cyclists. But I hope that as we continue our conversation, we understand that what we want to do is to put together a comprehensive policy. Like, you know, as we have a plan of how many protected bike lanes we want to accomplish every year, as we already have all the plans, we just want to have to be sure that there is a plan that we can hear from DOT, you know, that concrete information. How many, inter, inter, uh, 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 how many inter, uh, intersection that we have that is heavily used by pedestrians that they are not protected by today. We don't want to be in the news, in a TV newspaper, when there's an, a, a similar terrorist attack as the one in London, and for us to say that was a particular plaza that we will benefit. If we as a city know that every year we have to protect those, those areas for pedestrians. So no, this is something that I, I just wanted to be sure that if you look at the bill, the bill is not, it's very concrete. The bill is trying to put together a policy. The bill is trying to put together a plan where with the assessment of DOT, we will work in collaboration with you. We know that the designing, the specific detail that the design is, is something that internally the agency is the one that has to take care. However, to have a plan, to have a goal of what, how are we doing at 23rd and Broadway? How are we doing even around Times Square or the area that we need to have a pedestrian bowlers because vehicles as weapons of mass destruction, that's, it looked like that's the new way of how terrorists, they're going after innocent people. So we just want to be sure that we understand that, you know, that we are clear on, on our goal. It's not to tell the DOT on the, into the, the small details, but it's about putting together a policy on how we are gonna be protecting our uh, plazas, school, entry to the park, and, and uh, uh, congested intersections. It, when it comes to the TLC, and I want to jump into the TLC on the uh, tipping driver tip, uh, the tipping to drivers. Uh, I also want to be clear that you know, first of all, we've been working together for three years uh, in a very good collaborative way. You know, trying to level the playing field of all sectors in the taxi industry. Uh, but when it comes to making any change by bill, by the law or by rule, we want to be sure that we understand it, that when a council pass a bill, assuming that the mayor will sign the bill, then TLC will do a rule to vote on implementing the language of the bill. However, when a change is made by rule, then the council can make changes by law but the law made by the council signed by the mayor cannot be changed by rule. I understand the difference that you have of some aspect in what you are sharing with all that concern that you have on the rules. And I hope again that we can have conversation with you team and see how we can navigate together. So as you will be voting as a rule, we want to be sure also that we codify this law so that whoever the new commissioner four years from now or the new administration that we know that this is something that we will leave it permanent. Um, yeah, and I do want to say I, I believe we've worked well complementing each other in areas where TLC rules um, do not have authority, city council and the transportation committee, especially yourself, have been a leader in making changes to the local law. And in fact, two of those changes, notably the universal license where you made a dramatic change to the administrative code and um, the distinction between the independent and corporate medallion, another example of a dramatic change to the independent code, 
also underscore that we don't live in a world of permanence either at the council level or the TLC rulemaking level, and a change in commissioner, change in administration, change in speaker can result in a change of any one of those things, local law or TLC rule. Nothing is etched in stone. Um, but working together, I think, with our expertise in, in how the, the industry works on a day-to-day -day level, um, we can definitely be of assistance to guide any language um, that if council chooses to go this route, that it definitely be all-encompassing, that it provide drivers with an effective tool to ensure that they get the entirety of the tips, and that it apply to every sector of drivers so that no one sector is left out of the benefit of the protection of a, a tipping mandate. But uh, we appreciate, as always, your consistent work in the area of protecting drivers. So let's hope that our staff continue conversation around what you have in the language in the rule as we also are moving in this uh, legislation. So, and I have other questions, but my colleagues also have a question. Council Member uh, Matthews, Mario. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let me just uh, re respond to, in general, to some of, of your testimony on the two bills that I introduced. Uh, one, the, the bills are introduced not to uh, prevent the work. We know the work is needed. The, the bills are, are introduced to ensure that we're planning right and that we're making the necessary repairs once the work is um, finished, which, quite frankly, I don't think collectively the, the agencies, the utilities, and everyone involved, we've done a good job. Um, we certainly, certainly are not looking and government likes to talk about passing costs on to our constituents. It's, it's a line you use a lot when you're talking about a bill you don't agree with. We're not looking to add added costs, especially the, the numbers that you have here um, to our constituents and small businesses. Um, obviously, that, that's a non-starter for us. What we're talking about is introducing bills that where we can come to uh, an agreement, whether it's legislatively or policy-wise, to make this process better. The process doesn't work now. I've been in government in, since 2004. It hasn't worked since then. Um, so let, let me just get, let me just be specific on 13, uh, the, the notification bill. Um, I see that you obviously have issues with um, that would add um, to your administrative duties, and it, it's tough to, to let us know. Is your concern that you're worried that we're trying to prevent the work from happening um, and that there's weigh in from the community and the elected officials to stop the work because the intent is purely for notification. And if, if some of the language has changed to say when you know and you notify us, meaning the, the local council member, the borough president, and the community board, is the same, do you have the same objection to letting us know when you know about a permit that you issued to open a street? Because, and I'll let you answer in a second, but 50% of the problems in government is communication. And when we're working together and I can inform my constituents and the borough president can inform Staten Island constituents and, 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 and the rest of the city can inform their constituents when a, a, a cut is, is happening on a street that was just resurfaces, it helps the anger, it helps the confusion. And that's what we're trying to do on the notification bill to ensure that there's transparency and that when a street was resurfaced and two days later, it's, it's opened, uh, it's frustrating, and, and, and a Staten Island driver will, will seek us out all the time. And so we're looking to ensure that, there's prop, that there is proper communication between the agencies, the utilities with you, and then us, so that we can all know what's happening on a street that was just resurfaced. Uh, we would have no problem in notifying you when permits are taken out. Our objection is waiting 10 days before we actually approve the permit. Uh, we feel that that is the burden that's placed on us. 
Uh, we also feel that that places a burden on the, the, the utility or the contractor or a plumber that's doing work. Uh, so that's our biggest concern is the, is the whole time that's being talked about. Okay, so is there a time frame that is acceptable? I think that's something that we can talk about uh, after I can't give you a time. No, okay, frame, because listen, and, and, and that's part of the reason why we introduce legislation and have discussions offline and hearings to come to the right balance and the right agreement. Um, and if 10 days like to is too that. much and it's causing a problem, that's fine, uh, you know, but for me, the notification bill is the, the one, the easier one to push to make sure that we're doing it right and that, and that at the end of the day, it's most important that our constituency knows what's happening. And with social media and my colleagues and I on social media every day speaking with our constituents directly, it's helpful. We're being helpful to the agency and the utilities to say, hey, there's emergency work being done on Richmond Road today. You know, we understand it was just it was just resurfaced, but this work ha is needed. You know, there's a leak, and we're, we're we're collectively working to make sure that the repair will be made, um, you know, satisfactorily, which which I'll talk about in a second. So, I appreciate the your willingness to work on the notification um, because I think that's something that we, we should be moving rather quickly um, to get done. So when DOT resurf mills and resurfaces the street, one of the frustrations is the two to three week time frame that they leave the street milled. And you know, the sewer uh, caps are, are, are Raised. open and it's quite, you know, it's just as bad as when in this pothole. And you know, we tell them that it's two weeks for a few reasons. Um, the schedule on Staten Island, I'm speaking on Staten Island, I'm, the other boroughs may have a different um, schedule, but when I talk to my borough commissioner, the two weeks are for the the the, the contractor to catch up on the resurfacing because they're milling with DOT workers and then using contractor. That's how it is done now. But it's for utilities to also have a chance to come in and make the work. So please explain for the record of the process that when you know. Richmond Road and Staten Island is going to be milled and resurfaced. How are you reaching out to utilities to say, do you have planned work? Can we move it up? Can we do it within the two weeks? And just just go through that process so we can understand better. Um, because I, I like to think that it's happening, but when you see the cut made three days later and it wasn't an emergency, and I'm not saying that's the case, but I'm just talking about the when it wasn't an emergency, it, it boggles your mind. So uh, initially we provide a schedule that is for a season. So first we say, this is the schedule we plan on putting out for this season. Then every month we have a coordination meeting. In the coordination meeting, all the utilities are invited, contractors are invited, plumbers are invited, uh, we even have DDC and DEP, our sister agencies, are invited as well so that everyone that has a stake in the street understand where we are and what our schedule is. So we have that once a month and we have participation from all of those, those different groups. Then every week, we put out a schedule that says that, you know, you saw, my, you saw my season schedule, now you saw where I was last week, now here, this is where we're gonna be this week. That is put out, it's on our website, it emailed out, uh, I believe. Yes, we all the, get it. The Staten Island, they even, they even publish it and mm -hmm. publish in other papers Advanced well. publisher weekly, we publish so it So we do weekly. everything we can to make sure people understand where we are. Uh, once we mill, as you're talking about, the road is open for approximately two weeks, sometimes longer. Uh, utilities have that opportunity, and they reach out to us, and they say, oh, I have this going on. Uh, I'm going to need an extra week. Two weeks isn't enough. We will keep that street open for them. So that communication is there. Uh, we're available. We're willing to adjust because we have the great concern that 
again, we don't want to pave and we don't want them to come in after and then open up after we've already paved. So we take a number of steps to bring everybody together, to make them understand where we are. We do this, you know, we provide information on a weekly basis and then once the street is open, we're available to allow them to come in to do what work is necessary so that we can keep that street open, they can do their work, they can finish, and then we'll come behind and close it up. Okay. So those are the steps that so we take. So I, I get the list from my borough commissioner early in, in, say, February, and it's a draft, but are you giving that list to the companies then and discussing, or are you saying what you're you're doing it you know weekly and then you're hoping they contact you so we we provide the list at the beginning of the season we have monthly meetings with all the contractors all the utilities all the stakeholders in the street and then weekly we provide updates as to where we actually are actively working okay do you do you have numbers on permits that you have given on streets that have been milled and not yet resurfaced? And if you don't, can you get it to me? I don't, I can, I can get that to you. We, we don't have that, but we Because can listen, I, I'm willing to continue the conversation with my constituents why it's important to keep it open for two weeks. As long as we're doing the utilities within that two weeks, um, it just, it doesn't, I'm not sure if that's the reality, um, but you know, because there are, there are those who want the resurfacing done the next day. And I get that there's a value in keeping it open if we're gonna do, if we're gonna do utility work. Right. Uh, the scheduling is, is obviously uh, another issue. So let me just get, I, I know Mr. Chair, I'm taking some time, but uh, let me just get to the, to the repairs. So, you know, like I said before, we introduced legislation to talk about how we can better the, the repair. Maybe curb to curb isn't, uh, the, the, the best way, especially with cost, but they're sinking the utility cuts. They've been sinking for a long time when, it, when a utility or whomever comes and makes the strip. We've been fighting uh, with the notion that the utility cuts work when they don't. And in our experience, and, and, I, and I referenced the 2006 article, is that when, when, when they make the cut, three days later, it's sinking. And I know that we've been working with your agency to try and make sure that the fill is better, but can you explain, you know, why they're sinking and what technology or methods are, that need to be used to make sure that these cuts aren't sinking um, and causing uh, the problems that, we, that we're talking about? So uh, one of the reasons the cut may sink is because there may be voids underground that are not in direct proximity of the cut. So someone could have a problem right here, right? Because that's where their facility is that they're going to fix. They can go down and they can dig to that point to fix it. But there may be a void somewhere else in the area around that, that is undetectable. And the problem that arises is that and this is what can happen, I'm not saying it happens all the time, is that once they do their backfill uh, and travel, tra ro uh, vehicles travel over the road, the road the, and underneath can continue to settle because there's voids. And that's one of the, the biggest problems we have, especially when there's water associated with a repair uh, or it's in the proximity of a repair. Uh, one of the things that we've done, two things that we've done that we feel are gonna help cuts be more stronger and last longer uh, is to require a concrete base. We used to allow uh, an asphalt wearing course and then a final restoration for, for that final restoration. Now, whenever you have a concrete base, we are now requiring that you have to put a concrete base back. Putting a concrete base provides you with a lot more stability than if you had asphalt. And the concrete pretty much seals with the other concrete around it so that 
the depression that you may have gotten with the soil settling underneath will not be so noticeable, will not come back as quickly. Okay. So that's important. And, and just the second thing that we're doing is we used to have cuts that you couldn't even describe them. You know, what, gee, what geometric, you know, is that? We wasn't sure. So now we're forcing everyone to square things off uh, so that we can get cleaner cuts, better seals, and we feel that'll last a lot longer. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because that goes to my, my point and, uh, and my, we, we talk about wear and tears on Staten Island um, so much so that I've allocated capital funding for it. And, and for those who may not be uh, familiar with the term, the wear and tear is uh, just taking a patch of the street where there's a lot of numerous potholes, milling it, and then resurfacing it. And the wear and tears work where DOT doesn't have to keep coming back and filling pothole after pothole after pothole. And we did a wear and tear on Richmond Avenue five years ago. There has been one pothole since. So is it possible to, and you're talking about the squaring off because that's what a wear and tear, is it that we should be doing more of that wear and tear type work where the costs aren't going to be astronomical and the, the, the street's going to hold up and they don't have to keep going back. Hikewood doesn't have to go back and violate. It, you know, is wear and tear a viable option here? You know, wear, wear and tear are isolated situations, and, and I think what you're talking more of is like strip paving, you know, that where, you're, where you're going out and you're, you're right. putting a layer over, and we do that primarily to buy us time. You know, we know that this street exactly. needs so to be before it gets resurfaced, resurfaced. Right. and so we do it simply to buy us time until we actually can get that street in, in, the, in the actual uh, rotation to be resurfaced. So I think that we do our best to use strip paving to our advantage when it's, when it's necessary, when we find it's necessary. Uh, but that, too, is just a temporary. You know, we're, we're, it'll right. last us one or two seasons, and then we know we got to come in and, and rip up the street, uh, mill the street, and then repave it. Okay, in the interest of, I, I know we have to move along. Um, I, I have other questions that we, we'll talk offline. I, I just want to reiterate, we're looking to find the right solution. We're not looking to find added costs. I'm not interested in a adding costs to my constituents, to my small businesses. It's a non-starter. I know there's a way for us collectively whether it's legislatively or policy driven to, to solve the repair problem. I do think that we will, I'd like to move forward quickly on the notification because I think it's important. I think communication is important and we should come to an agreement on what the best way we can move forward with the notification bill and talk, continue to talk uh, with the borough president and, and the agencies and, the, and the utilities on the best way we can um, tackle the, the, the restoration problem. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Mario Matthew, and, and we will continue working together, supporting all how important is it for you and the borough president, starting on the borough president, and for many other communities throughout the city. Last, now let's get, I also want to recognize that also we've been joined by Councilmember Levin and now Councilmember Chen for questions. Thank you, Chair. I'm also a co sponsor of Intro 1375. I represent Lower Manhattan, and our streets get dug up constantly. And um, that's why I support the notification bill, because I think that all of us need to really learn early on. So when is this going to happen, and uh, how soon it will be done? I think the, the milling of the street, right, you say you have to keep open for two weeks. What I've gotten complaint from my constituents is that it's very hard to walk on those streets after this mill, especially for seniors who have to use walker, uh, people on wheelchair. It's a challenge. So keeping it open for two weeks is standard, but are there times can we like speed it up? If there is no uh, permits, request for utility, do DOT take a look and see if there's ways of kind of like doing it quicker? instead of just waiting for the standard two weeks? So the- Or more, sometimes it could be longer. Right, uh, th there have been times when we have moved quicker than the two weeks. You know, if, we've, if we found ourselves in areas that 
you know, have been brought to our attention that are problematic in terms of pedestrians and, and, and people traversing it, you know, we have sped that up. But uh, in terms of the way our operation works and the amount that uh, our resurfacing can do to our milling, the problem is if, if we don't have enough milled, we'll end up non-productive. And, and right now, the mix that we got is pretty much uh, two weeks of milling can take care of one week of resurfacing. And so that's pretty much the way our pace have been going right now. Uh, but we have been, we have increased locations that have been brought to our attention uh, where necessary. But in terms of our operation, that's pretty much the pace that we've been working with and that has been very produ productive for us. So you, you do all for flexibility. I, I think that we, I think that we did complain to you about the area that was near the hospital and I think it was, I think I remember it was done a little bit quicker. We, but we tried. The other thing is that when a utility company, when they apply for a permit, how soon do they start work? That, I can't give you an answer on how every, every uh, you know, someone could apply for a permit today. They can start today. They can start next week. In the situation of when we're milling and paving, once we mill the street, as soon as they say, hey, I have these issues out there, we want them to get out there as soon as possible. You know, we don't want them to wait for, oh, we're in the second week now and there's two days left and they come out there now we actually encourage them to get out there as quickly as possible because quite frankly, they go out there, they say, I have this problem, this problem could result in that problem. So they could actually be out there longer than they want. So we encourage the contractors, the utility, the plumbers, if they have to come out there, as soon as they let us know, get out there right away because we, we try to push them to finish up in that time period because we do want to close the street up because we understand that it is an inconvenience for the community to keep it open even longer. And after the street is paved, I mean, down in my area where Beaver Street is and William Street is, it was finally got paved. Then all of a sudden, there was some drilling going on, late, you know, into the evening, and it's like, the street just got paved. So, and there was no notice to the community I just heard the drilling. Then I looked out the window, and it was like, wait a minute. Why are they drilling over there? That street just got paved. So I think that we got to make sure that the community know, the community board, the council member, so that at least we can answer our constituents' question. Because for us, is that then I got to go on the website. I got to call my staff. I have to look it up. Is what's going on? Is it emergency? Is it not emergency? And the other issue is that the contractor really need to get out there. Um, to notify the people in the surrounding areas. Sometimes it's a residential building. Uh, just to let people know that you're doing this work and the time that you're doing that work. Because oftentimes these contractors, they go overtime. So people say, why is it 10 o'clock and they're still drilling? And they shouldn't be. Or maybe if it's an emergency. If we know about it, then people won't complain. So I think the notification, it's so important. All you have to do is give people a notice so they could put it up in the lobby. People know that this is happening and they can make adjustment. So going forward, I think it's our responsibility as government to kind of inform people and also as, as a local elected, we need the information so that we can help. And you know, that's definitely something that we could talk about. And you know, I want to also uh, remind that you know, there is a requirement that on every job that the contractor provides some basic information on the work that's going on. So uh, that may not be put into somebody's uh, inside, you know, uh, flyers put into the building, but those are things that I guess we can talk about on how we can do better with our notification. I look forward to that. I think they need to do more uh, in terms of letting people know. And so Xerox a, you know, c copy of, of the notice and then just give it to the buildings. It's just so simple. And it will help a lot of angry residents when they know what's going on. Thank you. Yep. Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
<clears throat> so um, a lot of my frustrations are, are, are not unlike my colleagues, particularly in, uh, from Staten Island, because we represent similar homeowners uh, in the city here. And, and often what we see is uh, a lack of agency coordination. And when we have a lack of agency coordination, certainly when you're dealing with private contracts, it's the same thing manifests themselves. Um, so in between, what, what kind of oversight is done to ensure that the, uh, the streets are put back in proper uh, order after the jobs are done? How are you not notified by the contractor? Do you then send out an inspector? And what does that process look like? So, so presently, if a contractor wants to work on a protected street, right? That's a street that was recently resurfaced within the past five years, uh, and particularly in the first uh, 18 months, uh, they, they, they request a permit. Uh, that permit is initially put on hold, and the, uh, the administrative superintendent of highway operations in the roadway, in roadways, the borough, they review that request. They want to know why you're taking the permit out, what work are you going to do, and they also tell them uh, the type of restoration that they are required to do. So once that permit is then taken out, the contractor can go and they can do their work. Prior to actually doing the backfill, they now have to notify HICWA. And we will spend, send an inspector out on site to monitor their, back, their backfill uh, and compaction. So those are the steps that we take to try to stay on, on top so of the work. In, in, in the in the instance that now I'm, now I'm going to give you a real time instance where there was some infrastructure work done on a local street, uh, and it was two months ago. Uh, the street has not been put back, and it certainly has been not been put back in proper repair. Uh, also, the, the the infrastructure work is now being done on the up the next street over and they've rerouted the bus onto that street. So it's, 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 it's a mess over there. But the street's been done for two months. Do they, are they uh, required to notify you immediately and the process begins then, or does the process begin and the inspector comes out when they notify you? What, where we're getting into is, is why does it take two months and, and the street is still in, in saying disrepair? So it really depends on the type of repair that's going on. You know, if it's, a, if it's a small plumber's cut that, you know, it's in front of one house and he goes in, that's something that should be taken care of in a matter of days. He does his, he does his repair, it's back Two blocks. You know, excuse me? Two, 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 so two months, two blocks. this is absolutely have to be a bigger job. Uh, they must have found other complications. Uh, and, and lest I go out and invest. There's no work being done. I, they I, finished two months ago. There's no work being done in the there's streets no, of Mets. I can't think of any reason, but if you give me the absolute location. And, and, and I did speak to, uh, actually, I spoke to the commissioner. We, we had a, a town hall scheduled for Monday, and it was postponed, but we did. She has that information. It is uh, uh, 119th Avenue between Farmers and 196th Street there. Okay, I didn't get so that. So that, that was Sorry, one what? of them. Um, and, and, and we talked about notification was just mentioned as well. And so we have to do an absolute better job on notification and, and, and what that looks like and when permits are, are issued. Uh, now this, this prop may or may not be an agency issue there, but I, last, last uh, Dr. King's uh, holiday, there was some work being done and it was not emergency work. And, and the residents thought it was not just uh, an inconvenience, it was disrespectful. And so we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. We aren't issuing work permits for, for holidays, are we? we okay, do. and then, uh, seems not to be an answer to that. 
talk about additional costs. You didn't really explain where that additional cost for the homeowners would come from. In particular, like we know that's a major issue when, when the uh, sewage lines are, are, are damaged and the homeowner has to incur that, in particular if they don't have the insurance. You said that it would, it, it would increase that cost and and five thousand dollars is a lot already, but the ten to fifteen is absolutely ridiculous. And I, I, like my colleague, don't see where that additional cost would come from. So what where, what happens is, uh, and and this is an example of a, a house connection, right? So a plumber would normally do you know a cut that's a two by two or something, right? and they would go, they would fix it, and then they would just normally just restore that area. This bill is saying, I want you to go 20 feet on either side, right? So I have a, I have a, a, a two foot, uh, a two by two that's now uh, 20 on either side, plus curb to curb. So now I'm going 35, 40 feet. So now a plumber, and a lot of them actually are not really prepared to do this, they have to come, they have to mill the roadway first. That 20 and- So that's not, that's not happening currently. It is not There's no milling currently. involved now. So, so in the interest of time- Only we, when we require it. Okay. So how do you know, and if, because I see it all the time in the district, but could we carve out these homeowners and these specific plumbing jobs that we see that, that are pretty occur pretty often, unfortunately, in the district. Okay. Okay, good. So, and, and, and finally, um, there was some, some streets repaved uh, in the district and everyone's happy, except for the fact that they're now flooding when it rains, which didn't occur prior to that. How do we fix that? They're, f they're now flooding? They're flooded, yeah. It is, it is not repaved, angled off, it is, is pitched, is, exactly, it's not pitched correctly. So you and have is, the some sidewalks pond, are now flooded. So you have some ponding condition. Ponding, it, yeah, and this is, it is it's, it's like a month old, and the recent rains have, have, have caused significant flooding. So in c situations like that, you provide us with locations, we'll go out there, we may have to regrade to run the water alongside the curb to make sure it gets to the catch basin. Okay. So we have to, Go out. We'll get you that information as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I have a few more questions. And going back to the bowlers, and which are the most dangerous corridors in the city measured by DOT crash totals and designated priority corridors? You're asking for crash totals as part of our vision? The group? most dangerous corridor that we have in the city. We have our Vision Zero priority corridors. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, any, what are the priority, let's say, Midtown? Which are those locations? I mean, historically, Queens Boulevard obviously has been a problem, Atlantic Avenue. We can send you a list if you'd like one. Yeah, well, I expect it to not getting information today because it's about the safety of pedestrians. Like, I would like to know after Times Square what happened in London, which are the two or three congested pedestrian area that we have in the city that we know that they don't have enough protection? Well, I think we want to make sure not to confuse areas that are potential targets for terrorist activity with areas that are dangerous traffic corridors. Because but the focus of the focus of the this bill is to address intersections where we have a high volume of pedestrians walking in the sidewalk that they can be targets for terrorist attack using vehicle as a weapons of mass destruction. The second priority is areas around the schools in plazas, not only Times Square, that there's no any pedestrian bowlers installed and trying to put together a policy where every year we revise the level of protection in those areas. Not subject to whoever the mayor is gonna be four years from now, 
but something that we install as a city so that we can keep every day collecting the data and having a plan. Like, what is, like, do we, those, and again, like, I really like DOT is no great commissioner, great team working together, right? Those are areas that we hope that we can keep improving. Like, beside the pedestrian bowlers, mm -hmm. or can we agree that pedestrian bowlers as today is the only mechanism that we have to stop cars getting into sidewalk? I would not agree that I, with that. I think we have a larger toolkit of items that we can use to prevent cars from accessing sidewalks. What other tools that we have that stop a car to get into sidewalk beside bowlers? Cement and metal. Well, there are a number of security rated items that we can use, and then and those are particularly used for intentional terrorist attacks. But we also, through our Vision Zero program, we've implemented a number of uh, tools to make sure that cars don't accidentally jump upon curbs, you know, to ensure safer driving, less reckless driving, to keep people from driving onto curbs and injuring pedestrians. But we would not use bollards as a Vision Zero safety tactic. They're particularly for intentional attacks. I, I think that we, I just hope that we can continue conversation, our staff from the committee and, and the staff of DOT. Yes, because I, as you know, Vision Zero is priority for both. We're making a lot of good progress. We have passed more than 40 bills at the council, supported all by the administration. And we know that Vision Zero is top. We can celebrate that we got the speed camera mm -hmm. a bill passed in, in Albany too, yes, which is a happy. big one for us. And as we have a plan to have a number of speed cameras installed, and we went to open it to ask, what the council is saying is, let's also have a plan so that we can say how many plaza, how many schools can we say that they are protected so that vehicle, they should not jump into the sidewalk so that we know that the students are safe. Well, we would be happy to discuss this bill further with the council and to work with you. Um, yeah. I would like to note that I think it's important Rather than having a prescriptive plan up front, we need to make sure that we have flexibility to address changing terrorist attacks over time. Because right now, cars driving into public spaces is a, is a big concern, but there are going to be additional concerns and things may change over time. And we want to make sure we're able to adapt to them quickly. And we can agree with that. It, we can agree on, on moving forward. Just having the conversation, I, think, I believe, on importance of putting a policy in place for future administration for a year from now for future commissioner for a year from now, but also to give the agency the flexibility also to work with the designers. So I'm fine with that. It, we, when it comes to TLC and the tipping bill, I know I heard so that the commissioner had to leave. It, it, I want to go back into what I said at the beginning. We do agree that if on the different, let's say, first of all, we agree that we can work together, right? Absolutely. That we can get the things by rule and we can, you do by rule and we can work together by legislation, codifying this for, again, to leave it permanent, knowing that there's concern uh, coming from TLC also that we are open to discuss with you on this bill. A absolutely, and our staff would absolutely be willing to work with you as well. Great. It, 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 what is the reality as today Library basis and Uber. Do we have a number of Uber drivers that they are also affiliated with basis? Uber currently has one livery base. I'm not sure off the top of my head what the number of affiliated vehicles they have are or how many drivers they dispatch. Uh, these are certainly numbers we could provide your office. But is that a case also that many livery bases, they also have Uber drivers working for them? Uber has a black car, owns several black car bases and a livery base, so they have access to a, a wide range of drivers affiliated with both black car bases and livery bases. Yes, Uber have few livery bases, but is, do, are we observing cases today where livery driver, where Uber drivers, yes. they are also affiliated with livery that they are not Uber livery? Uh, yes, we, we've seen in our records that Uber's dispatched uh, drivers affiliated with other livery bases from their livery base. And this is yeah, this something is, that we should also talk because I, the law as it is right now, it doesn't allow. Uh, 
The, the rules as it exists right now allows Uber to dispatch other livery drivers from their livery base. Uh, what, what but they, no, not, not an Uber driver to be affiliated in another livery base. Uh, no, they are currently allowed to do that. Uh, so long as the dispatch comes from Uber's livery base, they are allowed to dispatch another driver affiliated with a different livery base. What they're prohibited from doing is dispatching a livery driver from any of their black car bases. Okay. How much uh, are those bases who uh, were a uh, passenger allowed to uh, tip the drivers able or mandated to share that information with TLC? Uh, uh, bases that are allowed to. Does it till like we have a number of bases? Yes. A liberate and and. And up to now, we have been a general policy that a, pass, a, a, a passenger has the option to tip a, a driver in, in delivery basis. Does TLC also collect report? Are, are those bases mandated to report that information? We, we don't currently routinely collect any fair information, including any tipping information. Um, so we don't, uh, I, we don't have any data right now on the number of bases that accept tips via cash, app, credit card, or anything like that. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Menchaco. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for being here. I think most of the questions that I wanted to ask were, were asked, and, and so I'm really ha thankful that we're going to be working together to really shape a bill that has uniform understanding across the board so that everyone has the opportunity for, uh, for tipping. Uh, we are in a city where uh, I think there's culture around tipping uh, our, our our service uh, our service folks, and so I want to make sure that that we, we get there as quickly as possible. I do have some specific question about some of the data and al analyzing the, the taxi trips. Yes. And how frequently do you estimate that drivers actually do tip where they're able to? Uh, we don't currently collect any in fair information in the FHV side, uh, so it, we don't have that data available right now. I You're not collecting it? We, we, don't, we don't collect it right now. Right now? Yeah. We do collect it for the taxi, so we do have some data uh, about the percentage of tips and what the tips are on taxi trips. What, um, what does that look like? I, I don't know that off the top of my head. I'd be happy to provide your office with those numbers. Okay. That would be helpful um, to have that information. Um, okay. Well, that kind of renders the rest of the questions um, uh, for a later time. Yes. So then the, last, the next question I want to ha have is really thinking about how, how, uh, how you understand the current market and if there are any other for hire vehicle services out there that don't do this tipping. Do you, do you have a sense about who's, who's not doing it right now? I mean, obviously the big player uh, right now that wasn't allowing in-app tipping was Uber. Um, the other major app companies were aware uh, allow in-app tipping. Um, Anecdotally, I think uh, Via is another major app player that doesn't allow in app tipping currently. So, this does apply to a handful of bases. It's, Got it. So, w what I'm hearing from you is, is there's a lot of anecdotal information. So, it sounds like we're, we're both looking at this at the same way without any, any kind of uh, city, a city effort, a priority. Uh, and, and so, I, I think the message here is that TLC needs to really take this seriously. This bill is here for that reason, and we're hoping that you can come back to us with a real sense of, of, of review and data around what's happening in our, in our, um, in our uh, um, app-based for, for hire vehicle services. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, as the chair mentioned earlier, uh, the rule package that we have proposed right now, it's up for a hearing on July 13th, uh, furthers the city council bill's goal of ensuring that all bases allow drivers to receive tips uh, in an easy and seamless fashion from passengers. So to the extent that we can work with the council on that, we'd be happy to further that goal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no more question from my colleague, I'd like to thank everyone representing DOT and TLC for being here. Now we're calling a the re Christopher Delicio uh, representing the uh, starting Island Borough President, former colleague James Otto.
Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Christopher DeSico. I'm counselor to Borough President James Otto. I'm going to be reading his testimony. He regrets he couldn't be here, but um, he has three of our Staten Island winning uh, baseball and softball teams at Borough Hall today that he's honoring. Um, Uh, you may be familiar with the term pave baby pave it is a rallying cry we at borough staten island borough hall and eventually all of staten island took up in our efforts to convince the administration to reverse the course set by the previous administration and finally invest in our crumbling roads the numbers tell the story from fiscal year 2000 to fiscal year 2014 we only hit the 1000 lane mile mark which is considered the minimum necessary to maintain maintain our roads in a state of good repair four times in a December 2014 op-ed, Borough President Otto asked the new administration to create a Marshall Plan for our roads and commit sufficient resources to not only meet the 1,000 lane mile mark, but to exceed it in a significant way. Within months of that op-ed, the mayor announced a $242.1 million infusion to do just that. And to their credit, the administration has extended this initiative each year since then. The fact is that as the unprecedented investment on our roads kicked into full gear, it became clear that we had a problem. Staten Islanders began noticing utilities or contractors begin to make cuts into those freshly paved roads. And we get those calls, emails, and social media requests all the time. This is like a collective slap in the face for residents and a horrific waste of resources for city taxpayers. And as we know, simply restoring a trench with asphalt means the trench will soon fail and our freshly paved roads will be filled with multiple divots. Intro th uh, 1375 is a simple notification bill. As elected officials that have been vocal on this issue, we get messages on social media almost a daily, on almost a daily basis from residents who are irate that their freshly paved road is being dug into, and they want answers. They want to know why. And we don't have the information to give them usually. So we have to go to the local DOT to ask for the information. They give it to us. Uh, this legislation would simply require DOT to provide us and the local council member and the local community boards with that notification 10 days, at least 10 days before approving a permit for cutting into a protected street in a non-emergency situation. Uh, we're partners in government, we're supposed to be, and there's no reason we shouldn't have this information. This would also give us a chance to do our jobs and truly vet the request in a way bureaucratic institutions sometimes fail to do. Uh, recognizing that true emergency situations that endanger public safety or will likely cause imminent interruption of utility service are different, the legislation requires the same notification no less than 24 hours after issuing such an emergency permit. This will also allow us to have the information we need at our fingertips to respond to the inevitable constituent queries that will soon come once the jackhammers start on the newly paved street. Um, Council Member Matteo mentioned, I mean, it's, it's just good. It, it will help us get the message out to Staten Islanders who want to understand why this is happening if we have the information at our fingertips. Uh, while intro 1375 deals with the time before a street cut has been made, intro 1397 seeks to improve the quality of the restorations after has cut has been made in a newly paved street. It's just common sense that those who make a cut should restore it as closely as possible to its condition after it was resurfaced. And this is the best way to protect the city's resurfacing investment. The legislation will require those who cut into protected streets to restore the pavement from curb to curb and 20 feet in each direction of the cut. This would eliminate much of the ambiguity or discretion that currently exists and would mean the end of the narrow utility strips that soon lead to divots would continue to plague so many of our roads and they always fail. Um, while we are open to discussing whether 20 feet on both sides of the cut is ideal and whether curb to curb is the right standard, the premise is the same. The status quo is no longer acceptable, and utilities and contractors must respect the city's investment by restoring the road as best as possible, as closely as possible to the condition it was in. Intro 1397 would be a wake-up call for all who cut into our streets and a reminder that they must be a full partner in protecting the investment made by city taxpayers in our roads. The, the status quo isn't working. It's time for us to find a new way. Curb to curb and 20 feet on each side or a similar standard would eliminate failed trenches and help us improve our roads. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this important issue and we look forward to working with the council and the administration on reforming this process uh, that's been broken for far too long. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and, and you bring an important uh, uh, you know, suggestion how we can work not only around the Staten Island but as I say through the whole city. Thank you.
Mario Senna, Ryan Price, Jose Mulero, Alex Iacobi, Stephen Savner, and Michelle Dotton. Are you ready to testify, sir? Yes. Sir? Just a moment. Okay. So you may start. I think that you need to put the microphone, touch the button, the red light. Got it. Okay. So good morning, Chairman uh, Rodriguez and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Ryan Price. I'm the Executive Director of the Independent Drivers Guild, testing on uh, intro 1646. Um, the IDG is a nonprofit affiliate of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, the IAMAW, that represents 50,000 working drivers throughout the for hire vehicle industry. Um, the Machinist Union have been the only union to success successfully organize black car workers in New York City and have been doing so for about 20 years. Um, the IDG started in May of 2016 and we're focusing on organizing workers of the at-base for hire vehicle industry to win a more fair for hire vehicle industry. Um, on, or, sorry, uh, on behalf of our membership, first and foremost, uh, we thank you Mr. Chairman uh, for your leadership and support on this very important issue that will have a significant and meaningful impact on the lives of thousands of drivers of their, and their families. Um, we also want to thank the Taxi and Limousine Commission for accepting our petition to mandate a tipping option across the for hire vehicle industry, as well as Council Member Espinal, Chin, Lander, I'm in Chaka, Public Advocate Tish James, and Con uh, Comptroller Scott Stringer and many other city and state officials for supporting our long run campaign, um, which you know we've been pushing for a tipping option for about a year. Um, so we support intro 1646, uh, which mandates a gratuity option for black car and luxury limousine services. Uh, this legislation will provide a desperately needed raise to thousands of uh, New York families who are struggling to make ends meet uh, after years of pay cuts. Uh, we al also urge the adoption um, of four essential amendments to either this bill or with the TLC um, for the economic well-being of our members, 91% um, of whom are U.S. immigrants from more than 150 different countries, 56% uh, of whom care for a dependent, and 27% of whom lack and are seeking health insurance <coughs> and stress how vital it is. <coughs> and stress how vital it is that workers and regulators continue to work hand in hand to protect New Yorkers by implementing pay regulation. Uh, labor platform companies like uh, Uber, Lyft, Get, Juno, Via um, all know how important it is to their laborers to have a tipping option, uh, but those companies seem incapable of developing a policy that workers are actually asking for. Uh, those companies know that Americans are struggling to pay their debts and often feel fortunate just to have a job. So when companies slash pay, I didn't realize it was time. Um, when they slash pay, the workers are pressured to perform. Point is this: we support the bill. Um, we have a few amendments that we have uh, in the written comment, which we can discuss if you'd like. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle, and I'm a driver for Uber. I've been doing it for. Can you say your name? Yes, speak directly to the microphone and say your name. Hi, I'm Michelle Dotton. I'm a driver for Uber. I've been doing that for about 16 months. Um, and I feel that 
the tipping option that they've put onto the system and we're asking for it, it's nothing difficult. It's just simple. I don't see why there's a big discussion. Uber understands this. it doesn't hurt them. If the customer is willing to pay a tip, why not have it there for them to have the option to do it? I thank you for pushing for it for this. I also thank, uh, thank TLC for also recognizing that it's no different than us people uh, being a yellow cap. Why would they have it and we not? We're not saying, and it's, it's also uncomfortable to have a passenger say, oh, well, you know, we don't know if we should tip or not. That shouldn't be in discussion. It should be just there. If they want to do it, they can do it. We don't want to have to answer a question about why tipping is, is not there or, or should be there. It's, it's courtesy, it's gratuity, it's a thank you for a good job well done. It costs us a lot to maintain our car, to have it nice for a customer to ride in, for them to feel a good ride each and every day. And so getting a tipping option will help us to maintain, to have a better outlook on our on the the passenger's ride and our ride as well. It's just courtesy. That's all we're asking for. Hello, my name is uh, Steven Savarder. Thank you for letting me be here with everybody here. I've been driving for about two years, and even though it's a short amount of time, I can say it has changed in that two little years. I'm a part-time driver, not a full-time driver, but I can still speak on behalf of a lot of drivers and only rates that go down from multiple companies is a race to a bottom. With this, I propose that IDG supports us into tipping. It's very important for us because you tip your waiters, you tip your bartenders, you tip, you, it's a service. We're, we're probably public service. It's still public service for hire, taxi, doesn't matter what you do. It's very important to have it. Um, they didn't get to the part where the Uber is currently only putting one, two, and five, which is not enough. It should be 20, 25, and 30% and other. Uh, so what Uber is currently doing is still is, uh, it's still an insult. So hopefully with this uh, proposal, it can be stronger with the TPET system, if I understood it correctly, is what I would hope it to be. Um, based on how far you go, how much you earn, because costs only go up, not down. And considering the fact that costs only go up, the rate, uh, rates are going lower and lower and lower, we need some sort of uh, boost in our earnings and tipping is such a, as something that's simple to be done, especially if you provide a good service. We're driving 10 hours, 12 hours on the road consistently trying to make an earning. We should be able to work less than eight hours like a normal person and make an honest living. It's a, uh, it should not have to be that way. And there's a hundreds of thousands of drivers on the road right now. And there's been studies showing we're clogging the streets. We, it's, it's got to like a car in every street and every block. So tipping will help us get off the road so we can get to sleep and spend time with our families. Uh, TLC even proposed a fatigue rule. Well, tipping could help us get off the street. Like, uh, thank you so much for letting me have you here. And first of all, welcome to the visitors that we have here. I assume many of you from other states and for other countries. And today we're having a hearing. This is the Committee of Transportation, and we are holding a hearing about a bill that will allow passengers to give a tips to the Uber drivers and the other 74 ad company in black car industry and limousine, something that is not happening right now in New York City. So when you go to a restaurant, you give a tips, but the drivers, the passengers who use Uber here, in the apps, you don't have the choices. So this is something that we are working in the city. A question, how much do you make per average in a week? Um, it varies. It could be as little, uh, under minimum wage, it can be as high as uh, 250 six hours, it varies, it's too fluctuating, and that's before expenses. So I can work 12 hours and make 60 bucks if I'm lucky. I can work 12 hours and make 500. It's just, it's just too all over the place, you know? Yeah. Well, I set a goal per day, so I try to do at least 250 a day, but in all, that also doesn't include what cost. If I, you guys were talking about the roads earlier, which is also a huge problem because we hit potholes, we end up getting new tires. A day could wipe out our earnings if we hit some of the issues like he was discussing earlier, the issues on the roads that 
really should be addressed uh, for the drivers as well. But if, if something happens in that day, it can wipe out their earning. So we, we are, we're never sure, but I try to at least do, let's say 1500 for the week, because that would sort of make me able to survive. But in that, to do that, I work almost 14 hours a day and sometimes seven days a week. The information that you've been able to collect with drivers on? Um, it's important to note that like your goal was $250 in a day. Um, many uh, workers have that, that goal that they have to make in order to be able to get by. Um, and they know that that goal, um, about half of that is going to go to expenses. So if you're making $250 a day, about half of that is just gone. Good. No, I, I always say that I hope the best for investors that are putting their dollars in the billion-dollar corporation or Uber, Lyft, and others. And, and I believe that our society always welcomes new ideas and, and that allow for the consumers to have their services. However, I think that and it, was, it was nice to hear that Uber also made the decision that now they will make the change in the apps for the consumers to also uh, be able to tip the drivers. However, and I know that there is representative from Uber sitting here, even though they, they are now in the table to testify, do you expect that after the announcement Uber will change the policy which allow the 30% that driver make because they were, they were also get putting together the tipping as part of whatever money they make. Has been any conversation with Uber or do you expect that after, with the change that Uber announced that now consumers is able to tip mm -hmm. the drivers, that the driver will continue making the same percentage that they are doing right now? Are you asking if they'll lower their commission? What's that? Are you asking if they'll lower their commission? Yes. Their cut? I don't think they're going to change that. Uh, based on the conversations that we've had with them, they'll take, take the same. Um, the tips, from what they've said, uh, tips won't be, or commission won't be taken from the tips. Um, but I don't think their commission is going to change in any way. No. Okay. If my colleagues don't have any questions, thank you. I do have an answer um, for Council Member um, Menchaca. Uh, we went through the, the TLC data and it was 97% of solo taxi passengers uh, who paid by credit card tipped and uh, most tipped around 20%, uh, which is where how we got to the $300 million number. Great, thank you. The next panel. Patrick Lespinas from Verizon. David Gamak from Con Edison, Henry Dong from Con Edison, Frank Prost from National Grid, and Keith Rooney from National Grid. My name is Patrick Lespinas. I'm with Verizon. Good afternoon, Frank Prost, National Grid. Good afternoon, Keith Rooney from National Grid. Good afternoon, Henry Dong, Con Edison. And David Gamak with Con Edison. Dear Chairman Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee, thank you for the opportunity to allow Verizon New York to submit testimony in regards to intro 1375 of 2016 and intro 1397 of 2016. 
Simply stated, these introductions both separately and collectively will lead to delaying vital and necessary services to the citizens of New York City. Additionally, these introductions will lead to increased cost to customers and further disruption and congestion of the streets of the city. Intro 1375 would require DOT to delay approval work of permits for 10 days. A notice requirement prior to the approval of permits by DOT will inevitably lead to a de facto review period, the intent of which is to clearly create an additional approval process. These delays and potential denials of permits for important work are short-sighted and pose additional burdens on customers seeking vital services. Currently, once a permit is approved by DOT, the agency posts these active permits online on their website. Community members and elected officials can access this information at any time. In our dealings with community members, many do not know that this information source exists. If it were properly utilized, um, they would have the same information um, that this introduction proposes to provide. To add another layer of review prior to approval of our permits would not only delay planned infrastructure projects, but also impact customers who are experiencing out of service issues, thus lengthening the time it would take us to get these customers back up and running. Briefly, introduction 1397 would require any restoration of payment made, uh, pavement made subsequent to opening a protected street to extend the curb line and to be surrounded by 20 feet of pavement on each side of such restoration. Um, Verizon works collaboratively with DOT's HICWA division to determine the best course of action. If the agency determines that Verizon or any utility has not met its obligations, there are remedies in place. Preliminarily, the agency issues the utility a corrective action request, which, re which requires said utility to remediate the particular issue. In conclusion, this legislation will increase the time it takes us to complete a job and also increase our costs. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez, Council Member Mateo, members of the City Council, distinguished colleagues from the utility industry, local elected representatives, and others in attendance. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss these important issues. My purpose today is to provide National Grid's perspective on the proposed amendments to the Administrative Code for the City of New York. Intro 1375 and 1397. As a utility company that regularly engages in excavation activities in the city of New York, National Grid supports efforts to maintain the integrity of city streets and more generally promote safe and efficient construction practices within the city. The council must consider, however, the extent to which the proposed amendments will encumber efforts to perform necessary maintenance activities and deliver needed infrastructure investments that will maintain the safety and reliability of the critical energy networks in the city of New York. National Grid's gas distribution network serves more than 1.8 million customers in downstate New York, including Brooklyn, Staten Island, and most of Queens. We operate and maintain more than 9,000 miles of infrastructure uh, throughout our service territory. Our primary focus is safety. Because National Grid's gas network, network is largely located on the ground, our construction, maintenance, and emergency repair work requires regular, regular excavations and streets to access these facilities. National Grid applies for approximately 45,000 excavation permits per year. National Grid crews work every day to ensure safe operations by repairing gas leaks, upgrading mains, expanding the gas network, and installing safety valves on gas services in accordance with New York City law. As we ramp up investments to enhance our network and meet the growing demand for, national gas, for natural gas, the number of street openings will only increase. Over the next 20 years, National Grid will place more than 10 million feet of aging infrastructure within the city. To reduce the impact construction activities, National Grid works closely with DOT, DEP, and DDC and other city agencies to leverage opportunities to coordinate its construction with city infrastructure replacement projects and road resurfacing programs. National Grid also employs a number of technologies and best practices designed to avoid street excavations altogether. While National Grid understands the good intentions of the bill, and supports the overarching goal of improved communications related to construction activities in the City of New York 
and preserving protected streets, the proposed legislation presents potential cost challenges and logistical concerns with regards to National Grid's ability to effectively serve customers in the city. As a provider of essential gas services, National Grid has an obligation to our customers, regulators, communities, and to manage its gas system safely and efficiently, and this legislation could encumber its ability to meet that obligation. Our primary concern with the proposed legislation is the potential for construction delays resulting from the extended evaluation period uh, by various constituencies for each new permit, as well as increased costs resulting from the proposed paving requirements. These construction delays could negatively affect system performance, cost increase to the company, and delays uh, for new connections for new services and jeopardize National Grid's ability to complete mandated work. National Grid's construction activities in the, in the City of New York are already overseen by DOT, DEP, and other city agencies, and our work is comprehensively regulated by the New York State Public Service Commission. Therefore, National Grid does not believe that additional oversight or approvals are required with regard to each individual street opening permit, nor do we believe that the additional pavement requirements are necessary given the current extensive requirements and will only serve to increase costs to utilities and their customers. Going forward, National Grid welcomes the opportunity to work collaboratively with the city and other stakeholders to deliver infrastructure investments as efficiently and cost effectively as possible. Thank you for the opportunity to address the council. Uh, good afternoon. Before uh, I read my prepared comments, I'd like to state that Con Edison is willing to. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, before I read my prepared comments, uh, Con Ed I'd like to state Con Edison is willing to participate in any discussions between City Council and the DOT. Good, good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the committee. I am Henry Dong, Director of Con Edison Construction Business Services, and I'm pleased to appear before you today. I'm testifying in reference to intros 1375 and 1397. My testimony will give you an overview of Con Edison's work maintaining and expanding the critical energy infrastructure that serves our city. I will describe how intros 1375 and 1397 would add unnecessary costs, impact parking, increase noise and traffic, and delay service to customers. We understand the concerns about cutting into streets that were paved in the past five years and street restorations that are not done properly. For Con Edison, proper street restorations are critical because the electric, gas, and steam infrastructure beneath the roadways must be reliably and safely protected. But this legislation will not lead to improved street restorations. Curve-to-curve -curve restoration will not prevent street depressions where backfilling and compactions are improperly performed. Proper backfill, compaction, and restoration are more effective for safeguarding the street long-term viability. A new mandatory requirement for curve-to-curve -curve restoration will instead create delays and unnecessary costly construction. This legislation will force repaving from one side of the street to the other regardless of need creating more traffic and night work. I would like to speak about our energy delivery system and, we, and the work we need to do on them every day. Our underground electric delivery system serving New York City includes more than 255,000 manholes and service boxes, 33,000 transformers and 88,000 miles of cable. We also maintain a gas delivery system with more than 2,200 miles of gas mains in the city and our district steam system in Manhattan with 105 miles of pipe is the largest in the world, serving iconic buildings like the Empire State Building. On any given day, Con Edison deals with emergencies that require immediate work on these systems in the roadways, or there might be a street light that require repair or installation, or there are new customer projects such as business expansions or a new school or apartment building necessitating new service or service upgrade. Todd Anderson has a responsibility to accommodate these customers and to meet their energy needs. If that building is ready for service within the five-year window of the protected street, we'll have to excavate that street to connect the electric, gas, and or steam service. We don't have an option to tell the customer or the school that they have to wait for the five-year period to be over. Intro 1397 would require the restoration of pavement after opening a protected street to extend to the curb line and 20 feet on either side of the restoration. 
let's take a look at the impact of this legislation in an emergency situation where there's a gas leak that needs to be repaired. Today, today the cost of mill and pay following the repair of a small gas leak in a six foot by six foot area is approximately $400 and will take a few hours to complete. On the intro 1397, the area footprint needing restoration on a four lane street would require milling and paving 180 square yards. The cost to mill and pave that area would be more than 40 times the current cost or $17,000. Depending on the permit stipulation, this work could take several days to complete. A wider street like First Avenue would cost much more. Spread that new requirement over jobs and you have dramatically increased costs and these costs will be borne by the Con Edison customers. Again, this work would cause more disruption to the residents and businesses with days of reduced on-street parking, lane closures, and possible night work. For a new building, whether it's a school or an apartment building, we have to be able to provide service and meet the customer schedule. Each situation is unique. Getting service to the customer would depend on the building's energy needs and what's currently available on our system. Placing these costly and cumbersome street restoration requirements on all protected streets, regardless of the work needed and when the street was last paved, would be unduly burdensome and cause delays. Intro 1375 would require that the DOT notify borough presidents, local council members, and local community boards 10 days prior to issuing a permit for planned work on a protected street. At a minimum, this would extend the current time it takes to get a permit issued by 10 days. If objections are raised, the delay could even be longer. We often have a short time frame to form our work to meet customer schedules or to coordinate with other New York City construction projects. We work closely with the DOT to expect that the turnaround time on permits. The additional review time would delay our ability to get service to our customers and add uncertainty to their schedules. This bill would cause delays in other ways. A larger job that covers several streets could require permits for both protected and unprotected streets. If the permit process for protected streets required a lengthy review, it could delay the entire job. There is more uncertainty for the work. We work closely with the city to manage all of our activities in the streets. We regularly coordinate with the city and state agencies, including New York City Department of Transportation, the Department of Design and Construction, and Department of Environmental Protection. We have internal organizations dedicated to working with them on street reconstructions, paving schedules, and street depressions. With constant communication and ongoing coordination, we do our best to avoid working in streets that were recently paved. Additionally, we are collaborating with DDC on further implementation of joint bidding so that utility work is embedded in street construction projects. Despite these best efforts, it's inevitable that we will need to work on streets paved within the past five years. DOT already has rules that direct us to meet additional requirements for backfilling and roadway restoration on protected streets. We also recognize the importance of letting elected officials and the public know when you are working in their communities. Con Edison regularly sends out notice to elected officials and customers, uh, sorry, to elected officials and customers know when we will be working in the area for extended times. We have seen many electors use this information and tweet it out to their constituents. We appreciate their support and getting the message out. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. So thank you, and, and first of all, we, the council, value the contribution of the private sector, and we know how important uh, it is for not only uh, those of us who live in, in the residential building, but also for our schools. And, 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 and all the entity in the city to get the gas, to get the cable that we need. At the same time, we also, you know, we are the one who get all the complaints in our communities. And, and we are like the middle person there. And any time that when the street is open or there's a plan to do some underground work, you know, we also get those phone calls. And I think that uh, the concern of my colleague in the, in the starting our labor president and all the leaders throughout the cities, like, you know, to share as much information, to be sure also that the quality of the work to be done also is uh, important for everyone. So, Councilman Mario. What? Yes, thank you, and, and thank you all for testifying. Um, I, I just will join in, in, in 
making a few comments. One, um, the intention of the bill is not to stop emergency works, not to prohibit permits. We keep talking about this today. It's not, that is not the intent of these bills. The intent of these bills is to plan better, is to make sure. See, what you sometimes don't understand is where it can be very helpful to you when you are doing the work and our constituents have no idea what you're doing. And we are able to tell them and we are able to stop the anger and the frustration because it's needed work. This is not to stop work. I have very good relationships with a lot of your offices, um, but quite frankly, over the years, utility cut, utilities have led to this problem by making bad cuts. And we want to make that better. And we could be partners together, or we, we can't. To see, with all due respect to Verizon's testament, to, to see short-sighted in it, these aren't short-sighted bills. Take extreme. Uh, to see the word short-sighted in, in, in a testimony telling us that we're short-sighted because we're trying to make the process better from a utility that has caused part of this problem is disrespectful. And we're trying to be respectful and work together. That does not, that does not help the situation at all. Okay? So with all due respect to Verizon, um, it, your testimony is off and to, to think that the borough president and I and my and my colleagues and Margaret Chin, who's a sponsor, are, are short-sighted in trying to fix a process that isn't working um, is just wrong. So I'm not going to ask any questions. You guys heard all my questions to DOT. We're trying to make this better. That's as simple as it is. We're not trying to add costs uh, to our constituents. We're not trying to delay. We're trying to make sure the information is out there and then when the, the cuts are made to the street that they're made better. We could be a willing partner together and make this better together or we can do it separately. But either way, we're not going to let up on this issue um, and all the jargon is not going to get me to change my mind that we have an issue and we need to address it. So with that, I'm going to leave it as is and uh, we will be moving forward with making sure that these cuts are restored better, whether we do it legislatively, whether we do it collectively, through policy, we will make this better for our constituents. Thank you. Just a comment, I mean, we know that the work that you do are important and necessary, and I know that we work very well together with Con Ed, uh, but we definitely can improve on the notification. Because oftentimes, especially in my district, it's, it's growing to be a residential neighborhood. And there are more kids, <laughs> and they need to go to sleep. And if there's an emergency, I think people understand, but a lot of times they're not emergencies. And you have contractors. Sometimes, you know, you, people see the kind of truck, let's say, or the Verizon truck. They know it's you. But there are other times, it might be your subcontractor. And they go beyond the time that the permit and it shouldn't be my responsibility or my neighbors to have to run downstairs and ask them for their permit. So if there's more notification to us, to the community, it's better for everyone. And we want to make sure that once the work is done, the street is put back correctly. And oftentimes, sometimes they're not. And so it's really, we want to work together with you. And to make, we're not, we're not asking to hold back the process. We just want to get improvement and to build better working relationships. Thank you. I hope that you know the conversation continue and, and hopefully there can be some compromise on how to get it done, but you heard from my colleagues, this is very important for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Latke from AAA Northeast. And, and that's gonna be it.
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alex Slatke. I'm here representing AAA Northeast, which serves a membership of over 570,000 drivers in the five boroughs. Uh, I want to thank the, the, the chairman uh, for holding this hearing and, and for the, the council members for, for attending and for sponsoring uh, the bill, certainly. Uh, and, and just to echo some of the comments before, I think the administration, DOT, and the council uh, all deserve credit for increasing investment in road repaving by um, really historic amounts, uh, 1,300 lane miles over in, I think, fiscal year 17 and 18. Uh, I mean, th those are numbers that you know, we haven't seen for, I, I think, in my lifetime, actually. Um, and, and, you know, we, are, we applaud everyone that, that worked together to make that happen, but we don't want to undermine that investment with some of these poor street cuts that are taking place. Uh, and I think, you know, this was a, a good dialogue today to start that conversation. I mean, we su I'll, I'll just kind of summarize the testimony, but, uh, you know, we support uh, intro 1397, and, and certainly it seems like, uh, you know, we'll, we'll need to have a, a further dialogue to figure out just exactly how this can be resolved legislatively. Uh, but it, it's uh, a real, uh, it's a real pain for people to, to see the work being done and then a, a couple weeks or a couple months later uh, to see it really be undermined with uh, utility work. To what extent is that actually an emergency? To what extent is it something that could have been foreseen? I, I, I think what uh, the borough president's testimony said is exactly right. The status quo is not working and we ha we'll have to figure out a, a solution to make it better. Um, and and that, that's pretty much it. I mean, construction is good. It's good to get the work done. Obviously, if there's emergencies, we got to take care of it. But let's figure out a way. Uh, maybe the, the curb cuts, curb to curb, is not perfect. But I th we definitely support the bill. We support the goals of the bill. And, and we're happy to um, work together to resolve this uh, situation any way possible. Got in under the timer. Thank you, and thank you to my colleague, who is here, Mario Matio and Margo Chin. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.